Hey guys, welcome back to the podcast. It's me, Tiffany, and I'm back with another episode. Today, we have a special guest, and I'm really excited for this. So if you've been watching my episodes, you know that I talked about my collaboration with Holly Shorts Film Festival, and I've been talking about hopefully getting interviews, and I got my wish. So mm-hmm. Meg, you are my first interview from oh, Holly Shorts. I'm really excited to have you here. Um, we have screenwriter and director Meg Swartlow here. Thank you for tuning in and joining us. How are you doing? I'm great. Yeah, we had our uh, screening last night, the LA premiere, and it went very late. So, um, but it was very, very fun. Yes, and I, I unfortunately was not there in person, but I am trying to tune in as much as I can online. Okay. And so, hopefully, I'll be able to like update you guys. And I definitely want to get some more interviews and do mm-hmm. some more interviews and everything. But today, we're talking about May. We're talking about No Overnight Parking, which is your latest short film, and it stars Alyssa Milano, and I was lucky enough to get early access to it, so I watched it last month, and it's one of the films, I tell you, it's one of the films that I'm still thinking about. Like, I watched a ton of them, and I was like, I need to talk to Meg about this. Like, I really enjoyed it. So just starting off, I really wanted to know um, where that idea came from, and I guess for those who don't know anything about the film, if you Mm -hmm. could explain a little bit on what it's about. Yeah, I would say the log line is a woman fleeing from an abusive marriage goes into a parking garage and gets trapped with a woman hating mass killer. Mm-hmm. About it. That's the yeah. I mean, like that's it is. It, there's sometimes in some of the submissions it's like what's the long version? I was like that's kind of the long version and the short version. Right. Yeah, so that that is what it, it is about. It's also a proof of concept for a feature which I wrote previously and then I got a lot of feedback of like the beginning would make a really good proof of concept. So, so I decided to do one and I, the inspiration is that I was, was the Sunday night. I went to get ice cream uh, in Los Angeles and there was an underground parking garage and my friend and I were just chatting away in the parking garage about to leave and a security guard locked us in. Oh, yeah. well, that really happened to you then. So that did happen. Oh. No masked killer, but uh, so that did you. happen. And they wouldn't let us, they wouldn't let the car out. I mean, there were stairs, so we, we got out that way, but they wouldn't, they wouldn't let us out. And there was, there was a, there was a, a sign and the sign was like, all the letters were falling off. They did it like earlier than they were supposed to. But my, my background is actually comedy. And this was a while ago. And it just kind of got my brain thinking about what it means to be a woman in America right now and to simply walk to your car, be in your car and be so threatened by men. I mean, I think that you like if a man comes too close, like, you know, I I have the instinct now because of violence against women that I that I am afraid. And so I wanted to extrapolate on that. And then I also had been in an emotionally abusive relationship a while ago. And so for me, it's the, can you break out of the parking garage? Can you break out of those kinds of relationships? Mm -hmm. And so that is what, you know, I think the best horror is internal fears made external. And so that is kind of the parking garage is the metaphor for the part uh, for the relationship. Yeah, I love that. And I and I think it's really relatable like you were saying how so many women nowadays are, you know, like if a man comes up to you you don't know them, you're immediately like who are you? What do you want? What yeah. are you going to do to me type of thing and it's sad that it's like that, but I think I would say pretty much every woman could relate to that feeling. Yeah. I think it's the stranger and then what is the reality is you know, violence against women is most perpetrated by people they're in a relationship with. Um, And I know it takes, I believe the statistic is seven times for someone to go and come back to those fortunate enough to uh, leave uh, before they leave. And that, that is the reality. It isn't, is not as cut and dry as, as I, as we'd hope it would be, I'd say. So it's, it's a complicated issue. Right. Right. And I was really, pleasantly surprised to see Alyssa Milano in this. Um, I feel like every time I see her, I always remember her as Phoebe and Charmed. Of course. Watch that growing up and I'm like, oh my gosh, she's in this. And so, you know, Mm -hmm. I've always wanted to be such a good actress. So how did that collaboration come about? Right. Yeah. I mean, I, I wanted to get someone who was a name actress. I, I'd actually 
won prize to make this in 2020. And so I was going to try to shoot it in April of 2020. Obviously, that didn't work out. And I was a much newer director. Uh, and it wouldn't have even honestly occurred to me to to try to get someone who was a more established actress. But I started getting into the festival scene with some other shorts and really saw that like Margaret Cho in Koreatown Ghost Story, that they, uh, Teddy Tenenbaum and Min Sun Park, got Margaret Cho in it. And I mean, she's such a phenomenal actress, but it also, it made me be like, oh, Margaret Cho's in this. Like, I don't know, it made, it, it made me want to see it more. And also, how did you get it? And so I talked to Teddy and he said that he got a casting director and wrote her a letter. And so I got a casting director, Bruce Newberg, through my directing mentor, Mary Lou Belli. I told him I wanted uh, Alyssa Milano because of her involvement with the Me Too movement. She's such an outspoken mm -hmm. human rights activist that I wanted someone who who the subject matter, it would matter to. And right. also that was funny. And so I wrote her a letter. I didn't know her. And I wrote her a letter and Bruce sent it to her. And he had actually cast her in Insatiable. Mm -hmm. um, and that was just kind of a coincidence where I said I wanted Alyssa Milano. And he said, well, I've actually worked with her. I've known her manager for many years. And so let's see. But I, I think I think she'll do it. Um, and so I wrote her a letter and she kind of agreed to do it. And I Zoomed with her a couple times. And it was wonderful. She was really, really wonderful to work with. Very down to earth and just game for most anything. Yeah, so it sounds like everything just aligned perfectly for you. Yeah, I texted her this morning. She was out of town, so she couldn't come to the screening. And I was just like, it went so well. They loved it. So that was it's. Oh, she's, that's good. Yeah, she's been really supportive and she just loves it. So that's really great. Oh, yeah, that's cool. That's cool. Um, and I really wanted to ask you, I guess, without spoiling anything for mm -hmm. people who haven't seen it. So the way it ended, I feel like it ended kind of open, if that makes sense. Yes. Almost like you gave room for there to be some type of continuation or a sequel. So I was wondering if you had any ideas for that or if you were working on uh, yes. part two for it. So the it, so it is a proof of concept for a feature. And the feature actually follows the four women who get trapped in the parking garage. Alyssa's character is the first kill. And so she, not spoil, spoiler alert, she, she dies actually in the in the feature okay. and the first four pages. So she's that, that warning of like, if you don't get out of these relationships, you could die. Yeah. So we have the four women in, in the car at the end and we, we actually follow them. So it's, it's about the, there's a Wednesday Adams character and she's, she's really the lead of the feature. Mm -hmm. uh, that's already been written. That, that feature is why I got the, I got a shoot your short from ISA. I won the grand prize of ISA, International Screenwriters Associations, uh, shoot your short, short grand prize. And I got some money and I got a lot of prizes. And so they had read the script, the feature script, which I'm still working on. Um, yeah. it, it is completed, but I'm, I'm doing a lot of rewrites. So that ended up doing well in a bunch of screenwriting competitions and festivals. And then most recently, Blumhouse and K period media picked it for their inaugural screenwriting lab, oh, which wow. yeah, it's very fun. And so I did that in March and we got to go to Sundance in January. Um, and so they've really, uh, they've really tried to foster this, this project. And so we met in January and we had four different mentors. And so they read the script, they looked at the lookbook, they gave notes based on that. And that was a week long screenwriting lab. And so my mentors for this project were um, Jacob Chase, uh, Danielle Crudy, uh, who did a movie called Blow the Man Down, and then Cooper Samuelson, who's the president of pictures at Blumhouse, uh, and then Kevin Williamson, the, you know, the Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm a fan of his writing, uh, yeah. Yeah. And so that was pretty phenomenal to, to have that experience. And, you know, I wrote this movie because of Scream, I felt like it was pretty formative in my high school years because of Scream, because of I Know What You Did Last Summer. So it was like pretty unbelievable. Like I, when I found out he was my mentor, uh, like I started crying because it was, it was you know, so yeah. it come true and to have him read the script. And for me say, um, you know, this this movie needs to get made um, was, was very phenomenal. So 
it was it was a, a bit of a surreal a bit of a surreal week so yeah that, i can imagine that's the plan and so i'm slowly making notes i mean making a revision off of mm -hmm. off of these notes and it's a lot of thinking um yeah so that's kind of the plan i they purposely the lab doesn't want anyone to be able to option it yet and mm -hmm. we have it hasn't gone out into the masses but i think it's pretty i think it's pretty fun <laughs> Yeah. So for your goal, would you want it to be something, you know, like a Netflix streaming or would you want this to be like a in theater type? Movie? I mean, I doesn't everyone want it in theater? Uh, yeah, I certainly do. And and being able to watch it in a theater is so different than watching it on my whatever, 13, 14 inch, you know, computer. Yeah. Uh, and so to see in the theater like last night, to hear the gasp, to hear the shrieks, to mm -hmm. hear the laugh. I always, it, I've seen it now in a couple of times and in theaters and audiences really do seem seem to respond and what i want at the end is to people be cheering and mm -hmm. that is what's happening and at each time people gasp when they see french stewart's name and that's been very fun it, it's happened a few times because i think they don't they don't think of him as as, as the character right that he plays so that that is always like, I'm like, are they going to gasp? And then they do. It's just so funny. Oh, that's great. And so, and I did want to ask you about that since you mm -hmm. said your film premiered last night at Holly Shorts. What is that experience like as, as a director and as a writer to sit there and have people like watch this project that you've been working on? Is it nerve wracking? Is it more exciting? It It is both. And it, so it's the L.A. premiere. It's it's played in a it's played in Brazil at the Fantaspoa. It's played at the Chattanooga Film Festival. Um, It's actually playing at Popcorn Frights this weekend as well I'm in Miami and so I've seen so I've seen it a couple times in a theater but this is the LA premiere and it's the Grauman's Chinese theater I'm yeah. from Los Angeles there there's red carpets there's just so many people so many friends high school friends and then screenwriting friends and Facebook friends I've never even met in person before all, all came out yeah and so it's very exciting but it's also nerve wracking where for me, I don't know if other directors are like, this is going to crush it. I'm the best. For me, I last night I like braced myself and thought like, am I going to be, am I going to be the dud? Am I going to be the one that it is not good enough or that, that stands out in a bad way for, for me. And then as soon as there was a gasp at one point in the, in the first, I would say like minute and a half, and then I was like, okay, I'm here yeah. for the ride. They love it. They love it. And then people, <laughs> yeah. people were like, oh, no, 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 Look in the back. Look in the back. And so for me, once that happened, I was like, oh, they're going to love it. And then it's yeah. so fun. It's just so fun to see. So that kind of once that happened, mm -hmm. I was like, okay, you can breathe. You deserve to be here. Right. Yeah. So, and I think that that is actually normal for creative. Mm -hmm. uh, I saw Regina Spector a singer the night before at the Greek theater. And she talked about how she was so nervous going on stage that night because she thought, how can I, she said this, which was great. Like, how can I go on stage and be the lead at the Greek theater? What, like, I, I'm scared and I don't, I don't think I deserve it essentially. Yeah. And she said, I'm just gonna think about this as playing for my friend's very fancy backyard. Mm -hmm. And for me, it makes me feel like, it's okay that I have these feelings and these fears, mm -hmm. but it's like, what do, what do I do about them? And it's make, still make stuff, still create stuff and know that it's okay to be afraid of, or, you know, worried about any reception, but not to let that stop me. Yeah. I feel like that just means you care. Like you just yeah. really care about it. And I definitely do. I definitely, you know, put a lot of work into this project and I'm going to continue so many years in a parking garage. <laughs> yeah. After this, you're going to be like, <laughs> you're like no more parking garages. Oh, my DP is like, uh, and I've worked with him for a couple projects and I've, I've known him since I was two years old. And he's just like, Meg, can we just do something like set, set the next thing in Paris? Like please no more parking garages. I was like, we still love to shoot a feature, Noah. Like that's gonna be a lot more days than two days. Oh man, that's funny. And so I know you said that you have a background in comedy. Where, mm -hmm. where did that switch going into horror? When did that happen? And do you kind of see yourself moving in that direction in the future? So yeah, my background is comedy. I started doing, I guess I started doing Im improv when I was 22 mm -hmm. and I performed for years. I performed multiple times a week in improv groups and 
through train through iOS and Groundlings and UCB and 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 love that. And then I started doing stand up, and so I wrote started writing my own material. Um, and I started writing pilots and features that were comedic, and I got. I got trapped in that parking garage and I was like, well, I've got an idea for a horror movie. I don't know how to write horror. Mm -hmm. And then I learned how to write horror. And I do think that, you know, Google is a tool and you can just learn so much. And yeah. you read scripts about how to pace things and how to write things differently and not to have huge blocks of text because you want it to be a fast read when the action begins. And I talked to other people who, who know horror and still know horror better than I do and had them read it and had them give me notes. And so I really, and I continue to try to learn more technical aspects of the genre. Um, and I think you should always be striving to learn more, to be better um, and to, to have more knowledge. So that's kind of where, where it started and where it is now. I think I will always lean into that dark comedy because that is just my sense of humor and yeah. You know, I think that's what people respond to the most in this project is they, and that's, you know, there's a lot of tropes in this and I, I hope you, I try to spin the trope on their head. Yeah. And so, and I think that's where the comedy, where the comedy comes in. So, and I, and I do think that horror and comedy are so similar where you're trying to get that reaction. There's the setup, there's a punchline, there's the afterburn. And so... I think it has that has set me up to hopefully create potent horror. Yeah, yeah, and I, I was I was glad to see a horror short film directed by a female because I feel like a lot of the big you know a lot of the big horror movies and short films are usually men. Um, yeah, so I was I was really happy to see that you were a female. Thank director. you. Yeah, I think there's a really vibrant female horror community, and it's actually why I started doing horror because I, my script was in some of these horror screenplay competitions and I would, or film festivals. And I went to some of them and just saw, you know, in the finalists would be two women and 11 men. Mm -hmm. And then I would see all these short films and think like, oh, all these men are creating horror. Lead characters are female. Yeah. Um, and I often could feel a difference when a woman would a woman would direct it. Mm -hmm. And so I thought like, there is a place for my voice, in, my voice, but also my hand in directing. And so that was in the end, the very, very end of 2019. So December of 2019, I directed my first short so that I could get some experience to direct the proof of concept for this. So yeah. it was a reaction to me, it was a reaction to all the men in horror to be able to start directing work. Yeah, exactly. Um, and I and I, and when you were talking about tropes, I was thinking about that moment. I, again, I guess without trying to spoil it, but <laughs> I guess we were already talking spoilers yeah. anyway. But um, Alyssa Milano's character, I think her name is Nicole, right, in the film? Yes, because one of my friends is named Nicole. <laughs> oh, okay, cool. I bet your friends like, oh, you named her. Yeah, Nicole and Claire, and they're like two very close friends. And Claire was in the audience last night, and I thought it was the sister yeah. character you sort of hear on the phone. Yeah. Cause she feels like a little sister, even though she's nine inches taller than I am. But yeah. So Nicole, Alyssa's character. Yeah. 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 That moment uh, where, you know, where you think she's dead, like you think the killer mm -hmm. got her, that moment definitely took me back. And I was like, Whoa, like what, what happened here? Yeah. And was that switch and she comes mm -hmm. out of the car and you see that, you know, she was the one that got the best of him. And I was so surprised by that. And so I, you know, I, I think what we're talking about now, I could definitely see that like, you know, most likely a male director would not have had that happen. You know what I'm saying? Like you could tell that it came from from a female director. Oh, th that. Yeah. thank you. And, and I think I think that's important. Yeah, as I said, like in the feature, page four dies, but that yeah. is not the spirit of the feature. Right. The spirit is you can get out. Women are badasses. Women will, you know, take a American flag wearing or mask wearing psychopath down. Um, and I really wanted that flip, that surprise, mm -hmm. and and the shot. I tried to get it a one -er, but I I it, it just looked better when there was a, a side angle. But when I shot it, and she, she you know she threw open the door. I was like, yes, this is why, yeah. this is why I did it. It's just so funny when you get that shot, and you're just 
like so excited that maybe you did something right. Yeah. And so, and I just, you know, I watched Psycho and I just took the, the hand coming down the, uh, the iconic hand coming down the shower. Mm -hmm. And it was like, yeah, this is the iconic move, but this is different. Um, right. What Marion Crane, like Marion Crane dies. One of the Crane sisters and dies. And, and this is, you know, she, she doesn't, she survives, she lives, she uses her weapon of convenience, her shoe to, to get him. And I think it's a fun turn. Hopefully, hopefully you've already seen it. If you watch this, I know, right? <laughs> so nice. I really, um, really want to talk about what happens in it because it was just so yeah. good. We loved it. Thank you. It's very kind of you. Yeah. And then I did want to talk a little bit about the costume design specifically for the killer um, uh -huh. because that mask reminded me of the purge a little bit. So I mm -hmm. want to know where, you know, the inspiration, where the design for that came from. Yeah. It's, I didn't want it to be too purge like, but the LED aspect of it is, is obviously like the purge, but you know, I wanted a mask. I, I, I think when you see someone's face, it's not scary. Mm -hmm. um, and I, and I want the mask to symbolize every man, the every man of, you know, incels in Amer America, the, the violence towards women. So mm -hmm. for me, I felt like it needed a mask. And then it was like Googling, um, you know, mass, LED mass. And there's a lot of ones that are like purposefully scary uh, with like the X's on the eye. Yeah, yeah. And I was like, this is supposed to not necessarily be scary. Uh, and to me, it is simply as it is, it, it is a bit scary. So I ordered a bunch on like party, yeah. party.com or whatever. Yeah. So, and then just put a lot of blood on it. Yeah. I love that. I love the simplicity of it. Yeah. And I would say, and I feel like it's a controversial statement that, that I do feel like in America, the American flag has in a way been usurped by, by a certain faction of people. Um, that to me, I'm like, oh, in a way, like it's taken on a, a different meaning. Um, mm -hmm. And that that is not what America is about. But I do feel like it's taken on a different meaning that that, that often that scares me. So yeah. that's kind of what the commentary is, which probably pretty over. Uh, I have yes. had people like, why the mask? I'm like, I don't know, guy. I feel like it's pretty. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I feel like it's just scary not knowing who's behind a mask. Oh, because yeah. Despite whatever the mask looks like, it's just scary because you don't know who that is. I mean, there's a reason why you've never seen Michael Myers' face. Right. It's just, it's, it's humanizing. Um, yeah. It humanizes the evil. And I don't want to. Exactly. Yeah. And then I did want to ask you too, I don't know if your short film will be streaming or for people who haven't seen it or can the film festival, where they <laughs> can stream it at or where they can see it. So it's on through the festival. It's on BitPix. Might be just the next few days. And then right now it's also on uh, Popcorn Frights. And then in July, it was on Shudder, actually, through the Theory of Film Festival. We had 10 shorts in You'd Like This. It's 10 shorts of female horror genre filmmakers. And so that was on Shudder, which was awesome, through that festival. Um, and so, yeah, and hopefully there'll be more um, festivals coming up. And they'll, they tend to play online as well, but um, it's not publicly available un, until, uh, you know, the festival run is over. Okay. Got it. So are there any other projects that you're working on right now that you'd like to talk about or promote or that you can discuss? Um, I'm actually have three shorts in, in the film festival circuit right now or three projects. One is called, it's a drama actually. And I, I directed it, but I didn't wrote it, write it. One of my best friends, Alicia Gaddis, who actually, have a, she's my rom-com writing partner. So I actually do have a rom-com that I've optioned and we're about, we'll, we'll take it out once the, once the strike is over. And she has a, we made a drama together called Alone Together, and that's going to play in some film festivals uh, around the country. And so we've gotten into some of them recently. So that should be, it's not a fun one. It's, it's a, it's a moody, it's a moody one. So mm -hmm. alone together. Um, and then I did a project called Give Me an A. And that is currently on VOD and you can get it through Amazon and Apple. Um, and that is a Roe v. Wade reactionary project. And we did that within 10 weeks of Roe v. Wade, Roe v. Wade being overturned. It was completed in 10 weeks and it's a feature anthology. It's 17 short films by female genre filmmakers. 
all of them are a reaction to Roe v. Wade um, mm-hmm. being overturned. And so I have the first short in that. Um, and mine's called The Voiceless. And it's about a woman who wakes up on the day and once the once once the announcement happens that Roe v. Wade is overturned, her mouth has been sealed shut and she goes to wow. very intense lengths to 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 open her mouth mm-hmm. and try to get her voice back. It is it's not my usual comedic flair. There's to me there's nothing funny about the Supreme Court taking away the majority of America's uh voice on, on yeah. America on women's rights so or reproductive rights so that that's available it's it's really amazing what tasha halevi did in 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 10 weeks and put this all together we've played film festivals all over the world we're mm-hmm. playing the cabro in a couple of weeks in mexico but it is also available for public consumption i don't know for six dollars and i really I'm, I'm really proud of of the work we did and mm-hmm. the stories we told, but I wish we didn't have to make the, the project. Yeah, 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 I agree on that. Yeah, so that, and then I'm working on a couple other screenplays, so. Okay, how, how do you keep up with everything? I don't know, I don't, I have a baby too, and so <laughs> I have a nine month old, and so I'm just like, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> you're just going, you're just doing yeah. it. Yeah, one day at a time, so. Well, thank you so much for coming on to the podcast. It's been such a pleasure talking to you. I really appreciate you taking the time to talk about this. Right. I, was, I was so excited to talk to you oh, about it. I really, so- really love your short film. Oh, thank you so much. It's so kind of you to say. It's it's, it's nice to get a positive reaction because you never know. Yeah. And so when, when Blumhouse picks up your feature length movie, save me a ticket. Okay, I will. I want to come and see okay. it. Yeah. 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 You, you'll have to text me and tell me that your movie's coming out. Mm-hmm. Oh, you'll know. <laughs> <laughs> and you can come back on the show and we can talk about it. I would it. love that, yeah. Yeah. So we'll see. Knock on. Wait. I know, right? I don't have any wood around me, but yeah. Okay, well, thank you so much. I'm going to let you go. Um, thank you guys for tuning in, for watching. I appreciate it. I'll be back next weekend, same time, same place. Um, do, uh, do you have any social media that you want them to follow you on? Yeah, that would be great. Megbot3000. There's two Gs in Megbot, just because the single G was... <laughs> gone so yeah uh, again uh, so it's m-e-g-g-b-o-t 3000 so okay got it so, so you guys follow meg swart low yeah. and watch her film just please do That's good okay thank you thank you take care okay bye tiffany <laughs>